night scale for 25 degrees on the Celsius scale. And you'll come up with the same answer. X will be equal to 45 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. But you have to remember that's a range. That's a range like 10 degrees to 55 degrees. Or a range like 32 degrees to 77 degrees. That's right. So keep those, keep those differences, range and specific temperatures straight in your thinking. Precision and accuracy is the next item on our list, but we'll do that in the next lecture. A better way to teach and learn chemistry. Unit 1, The Basics, Lecture 2. Precision and Accuracy. Precision denotes how close the measurements that you get are to the average of all of those measurements. But accuracy denotes how close the measurements you have are to what they should be, are to the true value. Here, let me give you an example. As our example, we'll weigh a dime several times. The first time we weigh it, we get this mass. The second time, we have this mass. Oh, pretty close. The third time we weigh it, we get this mass. And the fourth time, oops, looks like this mass is a little off, doesn't it? Well, just taking a quick look at the, the values here, it looks like the measurements are probably pretty good, except for that last one. It's a little iffy. But in order to do a more descriptive study, we'll add them up. Divide by 4 in order to find the mean. So we add up these masses, divide by 4, and find that the average of these masses is 1.891 grams. Therefore, it looks as if the first, second, and third are pretty good, but the fourth one's a little off. Now, we're not going to get into standard deviations at this point. So just as a cursory glance, we can pretty well say that these measurements are precise. But the question is, are they accurate? The accuracy depends on the accuracy of the balance we are using. Now, if we found by a better balance that the correct mass was 1.772 grams, then we know that while the measurements were precise, they were inaccurate. Significant figures. Oh, I heard some of you groan, but folks, we have to do it. We have to express accuracy and reproducibility of our measurements. That is a part of the validity of our study of physical sciences. And if you keep on going in your study of physical sciences, you're going to run into some other ways of doing this, other far more complex ways. Significant figures is not necessarily the best way to do it, but it is a good beginning. And here's how it works. All numbers 1 through 9 are significant. Well, that certainly simplifies things, doesn't it? Uh-huh, except for zeros. So the first question we run into is zeros. And here it is. Zeros are significant if they are between two other significant figures or significant digits. For example, 902. That zero is significant because the 9 and the 2 are both significant. Zeros placed for positioning a decimal point are not significant. For example, suppose you have the number 0.0902. Well, these two zeros are not significant, but this one is because it resides between two significant digits. Zeros to the right of a number are significant if a decimal point is present. To the right of the number are significant if a decimal point is present, like this. Now here we have a number with six digits, and all six of these are significant because, oh, there's a decimal point. 
the zero between the nine and the two is already significant. Those other three are also significant. Those other three zeros are also significant because of the decimal point. Well, what about this one? The same rule holds here. This one likewise has six significant figures. The nine, the zero, the two, the zero, the zero, and the zero are all significant. And most of them are significant because the decimal point is present. Well, what about this? Oh no, the only zero that is significant here is the one that resides between the nine and the two. The others are not significant. They are simply there for positioning a decimal point, if you will, are there for as placeholders. Let's look at some other numbers. The rule of exact numbers needs to be considered. Now, exact numbers are numbers obtained through counting, are numbers obtained by definition, and they are significant in their entirety. For example, you count out 1,100 apples, 1,100 apples. That doesn't say that you counted out 1,105 apples. It doesn't say that you counted out 1,099 apples. It says you counted out 1,100 apples. All of those numbers are significant. What about the fact that one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters? That's exact. And you may use those two numbers, the one inch in this case, and the 2.54 centimeters to as many decimal places as you need them. What about 1,000 milligrams is equal to a gram? It isn't 999 milligrams equals a gram, it's 1,000 milligrams is equal to a gram. So in each of these cases, the numbers have an infinite number of significant figures, if you will. Let's consider uncertainty in measurements by considering the volume of liquid in a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. Now look at this grad. Do you see the meniscus? You read from the bottom of the meniscus, the bottom of that kind of curved blue line. And what do you get? Is it 9 milliliters or 9.05 milliliters or 9.1 milliliters? Well, the 9 seems certain, but everything else is estimated. Well, what would you record for this one? Look again at the bottom of that meniscus. And you begin to see the dilemma. It is a consensus that measurements should be reported as the certain value and the first and only the first uncertain digit. Therefore, possibly you may wish to record this as 9.0 and this one as 9.2. It's time to look at significant figures and calculations. Let's start first with multiplying and dividing. In these operations, the answer will have the same number of significant figures as the number having the least number of significant figures. Let me give you an example. Suppose we take 1.03 and multiply it by 6.7. The 1.03 has three significant figures. The 6.7 has two. When we punch it into our calculator, we come up with 6.901. Are we justified in using all of those? No. So our real answer is going to be 6.9. And it will be 6.9 because the answer may have the same number of significant figures as the number with the least number, or the lesser number in this case, of significant figures, which is 2. Try this one. Suppose we take 7.92 times 10 to the fifth and divide it by 82.73. When we punch it into our calculator, we get, oh, a rather large answer. Well, large in that there's an awful lot of digits there. But are they significant? Well, you will notice that we have 7.92 times 10 to the fifth. That has three significant digits. The 82.73 has four significant digits. Therefore, we are justified in using three, 
Hence, our answer should be recorded as 9.57 times 10 to the third. What about adding and subtracting? In adding and subtracting, the answer will have the same number of places to the right of the decimal as the number with the least digits to the right. Now, of course, that's only going to work under somewhat limited circumstances, so maybe there's a better way of saying it. A better way of saying it might be to say that the answer will have the same number of significant figures as the least precise number used. For example, suppose we take 32.5, we add 8.63 to that, and then add 250. When we add this together, we come up with 291.13. Now, as you look at the significant figures, the least precise number is the 250. The first number, the 32.5, is precise to the tenths. The 8.63 is precise to the hundredths. And the 250, however, is precise only to the units. Therefore, instead of recording 291.13 as our answer, we should use 291. Let's very quickly look at a method of calculations called, if you will, the factor label method. And the emphasis here is on the concept of label, which really means units. A value having units, but without the appropriate units, is considered incorrect. Unless, of course, it happens to be a ratio, in which case the units have canceled. Let's work a sample problem. Let's convert the volume of 1.8 cubic feet to cubic meters. Now, how do we go about doing this? Well, the only conversion I know between the metric and English in length is that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. So if I start with feet, I'm going to need to go from feet to inches to centimeters to meters. So that's the path that I shall take. I start with 1.8 cubic feet, and I convert the feet to inches. I know there are 12 inches and a foot. But now wait a minute. I have cubic feet and feet. How are they ever going to cancel? So I have to do something drastic here. So what do I do? I throw brackets around the 12 inches per foot, and then I cube it. And then the cubic feet will cancel cubic feet. Now remember when you do this to multiply 12 by 12 by 12, because you multiplied inches by inches by inches and feet by feet by feet. Don't forget to do that. Now I'm going to convert from inches to centimeters, and I know that there are 2.54 centimeters per inch. But again, the cubic situation remains. So brackets or parentheses or something around that and cube it will take care of the situation just fine. Now I'm at centimeters, or actually cubic centimeters. I need now to go to cubic meters. So I'm going to multiply this by a meter per 100 centimeters so that centimeters will be in the denominator. And I'm going to run into the same situation about cubing, so I put brackets or parentheses around it and cube it. We should be able to cancel our cubic feet and cubic feet, cubic inches and cubic inches, cubic centimeters and cubic centimeters, and when we are finished, we should be able to have our answer in cubic meters. Work it through your calculator, remembering to cube at each point along the line. And I came out with 5.1 times 10 to the negative 2 cubic meters. Do you see how to handle that? Factor label is an interesting way to work problems. It keeps you from having to memorize quite as many formulas as you may wish to have memorized in the past. In this problem, which is going to be a really good problem to use to test out our ability to use the factor label method, we're asked to find the volume in milliliters of a teaspoonful of water. 
In other words, we have to convert teaspoons to milliliters. Hmm. Well, I don't know what what you know, but I the only conversion I know between the English and metric system using volume is I know that there are 946.4 milliliters in one quart. So this means that what I have to do is start out with teaspoons and get to quarts. So I'll start out with teaspoons and let's see, I'm going to go to tablespoons and from tablespoons I'll go to cups and from cups I'll go to quarts and then I can use that 946.4 milliliters and get to milliliters. Yes, this looks like a plan. Here we go. I'm going to start with one teaspoon. Whoops, not that. One teaspoon. All right, one teaspoon. Tablespoons, let's see, in a tablespoon, there are three teaspoons. Did you know that? Well, you should learn it. It's a handy thing to have in your pocket. Now, what about a cup? Well, a cup has 16 tablespoons. Do you read cookbooks? I do. You can find out all kinds of handy information in there. Let's see. Teaspoons cancel. Tablespoons cancel. I'm now at cups. And I know that in a quart, this one you do know, don't you? There are four cups. So cups cancel. Now I'm at quarts, so all I have to do is multiply by 946.4 milliliters per quart. And quarts will cancel. Now I'm at milliliters. Now you might stop this and run it through and make sure I come up with the right answer. And then come back and check me out. But what I found is, when I worked this, is that this is equal to 4. 9292 milliliters. Yeah. But am I, am I really, am, am, can I legitimately use five significant figures here? I better check it out. For the teaspoons, I can use three significant figures there. This is a definition, an absolute equality. This is the definition or absolute equality. This is the definition or absolute equality, and this is four significant figures. So I believe I'm justified in using three significant figures. Therefore, this is going to round off to be 4.93 milliliters in that teaspoon. Yeah. You sometimes see a teaspoon advertised or suggested as being approximately five milliliters. And that's good for an approximation, but this is our answer. In this section of the unit, we're going to talk about density. Well, remind you of some things regarding density. Bring in specific gravity and talk about the specific gravity relative to the states of matter. And then we're going to talk about the relationship between density and specific gravity. Density. What is density? You know what density is. You've been taught since you were knee-high to a bottle stopper that density is mass per unit volume, right? But now describe that to somebody. Well, density is a description of how thick something is, if you will. So specifically, it is mass per unit volume. Density is M over V. There are a couple of densities that you need to know. You should know that at about 4 degrees Celsius, the density of water is 1.0000 grams per milliliter. And I have been a little bit too generous with my significant digits here. The temperature is 3.96, I believe. But at about 4 degrees Celsius, the density of water is 1 gram per mil. And also, you should know that at STP, you remember STP from your, your past in chemistry? 
The density of air is 1.292 grams per liter. You need to know these because they're good reference points. In this problem, let's calculate the mass of a quarter teaspoon of water at 4 degrees Celsius. Now, what do I know about water at 4 degrees Celsius? I know it has a density equal to 1 gram per milliliter. And I've got to convert the teaspoons then into milliliters. And we did this in an earlier problem, but we'll go through and do it again. And then we'll add the rest that we need to add. So just like I did before, I'm going to start with teaspoons. That's a quarter teaspoon. I'm going to convert that to tablespoons. Now, I suppose you could learn a whole variety of things here, but I tend just to use these things I know and to keep it kind of simple. So, teaspoons cancel. Convert to cups now, just like we did before. And in a cup, there are 16 tablespoons. If you're cooking, you know that TBSP represents tablespoons. TSP is teaspoons. Oh, well. In a quart, there are four cups. And we know that there are 946.4 milliliters per quart. That's one of those values that you learned. So quarts cancel. Now I'm at milliliters. All I need to do is go to grams. So it's one gram per milliliter. Milliliters cancel. My units will come out in grams. Now work this through your calculator. If you need to, pause the video. When I did this, I came out with 1.02323. But I'm not justified in using five significant digits here. This is exact, this is exact, this is exact. This has four significant figures. This, the way I'm using it, has three significant figures. This has two significant figures, so I think I'm only justified in using two significant figures. So my answer then comes out in 1.2 grams. Have the idea? Specific gravity is a comparison. It is a comparison of the density of whatever you're looking at to the density of a standard. Specifically, it may be stated as density of x, which you're looking at, over the density of a standard. Now, it's important that your units for density and the thing that you're looking at and the standard be in the same units because they have to cancel. You see, specific gravity is actually a ratio, and as a ratio, it has no units. The standards you need to know are, for solids and liquids, we use water, usually right at four, about 4 degrees Celsius, when the, the density of water is 1 gram per milliliter. If we're going to use it at a different temperature, we will have to give you the value for the density of water at that other temperature. The standard for gases is air, usually at STP. You may remember STP from your previous life in chemistry. If not, don't worry about it. We will deal with STP and those relationships when we get to gases. Meanwhile, unless you're told otherwise, assume that you're dealing with air as the standard at STP. We're dealing with an iron bar, which is solid. And do you recall that specific gravity is the density of x over the density of a standard. And since we're dealing with a solid, the standard is going to be water at one gram per milliliter. Because we don't have the specific temperature or a different density for water, so we will assume that it is one at one gram per milliliter, or very close. Now the specific gravity is 7.88. Remember, that's a ratio. So that's the density of x over the density of water, which is 1 gram per milliliter. 
Therefore, then, the density of X, which in this case is the iron bar, is 7.88 grams per milliliter. Folks, it's very easy to remember that specific gravity and density have a relationship when you're talking about solids and liquids. And that is, and it's only for solids and liquids now, that the specific gravity will have the same value, numerical value as the density, if we're talking about the conditions in which the density of water is approximately one gram per milliliter. So if you see a specific gravity of 7.88, you can say to yourself, oh, that has a density of 7.88 grams per milliliter, or if you will, 7.88 grams per cubic centimeter. Now understand that works beautifully, but it works beautifully if and only if the density of water is about one gram per milliliter. Here's a problem dealing with a temperature other than four degrees Celsius. We have the specific gravity of mercury is 13.6, but it's at 25 degrees Celsius. And we want to know what volume would 100 grams of mercury occupy at that temperature. Fortunately, we're given the density of water so we can calculate the density of the liquid mercury. Specific gravity is equal to the density of mercury over the density of water. The specific gravity of mercury is 13.6 at that temperature. The density of mercury is what we're looking for. The density of water, those conditions, is 0.99797 grams per milliliter. So calculating to find the density of mercury then, we determine that it is 13.572392 grams per milliliter. Now the reason I wrote down this many digits is your calculator will probably carry that just fine for you. And we don't round off until we get to the end. Now that we have the density of mercury at those conditions, let's take our 100 grams of mercury and multiply it by one milliliter over 13.572 three nine two grams and I come out with seven point three six seven eight nine eight milliliters now of course I'm not justified in using that many digits I'm only justified in using three so my answer is seven point three seven milliliters I think you know how to round off if we had used one instead of this right here, we would have come out with very close to the same answer. But it is not the same, and you need to know that there is a difference. This problem has a little bit of a different wrinkle in it. We want to find the volume of a gas. And we're given the specific gravity of the gas, carbon dioxide. We're also told that it's at STP. Now, you recall, of course, that specific gravity is equal to the density of X over the density of a standard. But the standard that we've been using so far has been water, the standard for solids and liquids. What do we use for a gas? That's right, we use air. And the density of air is 1.292 grams per liter at STP. So with that in mind, then, we will find the specific gravity is going to be equal to the density of X 
over the density of the air. The specific gravity is 1.52. The density of X, or the, the density of X, the carbon dioxide, we don't know. The density of air is 1.292 grams per liter. So when we solve this, we find that the density of X, which is carbon dioxide, is going to be 1.964 grams per liter. Now, with that in mind, then, we can take our 80 grams times 1 liter over 1.964 grams, and that is going to give us, according to my calculator, it's 40.733 liters. Now we have the usual situation, how many significant figures do we have? Well, let's see. We have three significant figures here. We have three significant figures here. This, of course, we have calculated, and we're not ready to round off yet. So I think we're ready to use three significant figures in our, in our calculation. So we use one, two, three. I believe we have 40.7 liters of carbon dioxide. After a brief introduction in which we talked about the things you're going to need to survive in this course, we mentioned a number of terms, properties and changes, intensive and extensive properties, don't forget about those, elements and compounds, things of that type. We spent quite a bit of time on measurements. We talked about how to deal with measurements. We talked about the SI system. We talked about accuracy and precision and significant figures and things of that type. You will notice we did not mention rounding off because we think you already know how to round off. And from there, we went to density and specific gravity. And hopefully, we added a few items to your knowledge bank there and clarified a few issues in the process. A better way to teach and learn